back to the design of these sorts of things, how big's your design team on meters? It varies. Meters? From, uh, something oh, like a meter might yep. be 10 or 12 people. Right. You know, three yeah. or four analog engineers, three, uh, one, one or two mechanical engineers, and three yep. or four firmware, and maybe a software person. Oh, firmware and software are different. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, it's software, like as in PC software you're talking PC about? PC software, and then there's this kind of bridge gap where you yep. have the web browser technology, which is sort of a hybrid between ah, Okay, two. right. Okay. Interesting. And uh, software yeah. is one of the areas that we're investing in more heavily than any other area. We just right. started a new center in Atlanta, mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we've started a relationship with Georgia Tech, and we're growing a huge software center there oh, to expand nice. our standard software across all of our products. Got because it. software, yep. not everybody wants a front panel, and when you do more sophisticated solution-oriented measurements that have multiple pieces of equipment, mm -hmm. you know the front panel's not enough. Yep. So you take a Pixie system, there's no front panels, and you're, you're solving mm -hmm. a much larger problem. You need software to make that really fly. Uh, is every product going towards web browser, like a web <coughs> page built in, what's the correct term? LXI Where requires you? you to have some form of a presence on the web. Right, it, it does. Be so, because now you can go in and you can access the web page for the instrument. Right. And that's how you can control it so at a basic level. One of the things that I'm working on actively is if you go through all the different products that look the same mm. and you look at their web presence, what they come up with, it varies on product to product. Mm. Because this design team thinks this is what the web should look like, and this design team thinks this is what the web should look like, and this design team doesn't have enough money, so they did the minimum necessary, and, and it's, it's not good for our customers. Yep. Okay? Uh, we've had cases where we went overboard and spent over a million, two million dollars on our web interface on one wow. product. Um, yep. And it's amazing, but it, we could have done it with a software package for a third of the cost. Got it. The only reason they like it in the web is that the, the field engineers don't have to install the software before they demo it for the customers. So Correct. They, they, they can just go on their phone and go straight to the web address. And... Yeah, well, that's not a reason to spend two million dollars. Yeah, right. Okay? And the, the problem is everybody thought the web was going to not have to be updated. The web mm -hmm. was always going to stay the same. Well, you can't get Java, can you? You can't yeah, get Flash, right. can you? So it hasn't yep. worked out to be as good, and uh, it's evolving just like every other part of the PC is evolving. So yep. it hasn't been this zero maintenance thing we thought it was going to be. So we're pulling the web back to more of a common level that's going to be more standardized across our products and more, more rapid for us to deploy more easily. Still give you the local control over the web, which people want, uh, but not as full-blown as some products have done, and it's not as stripped down, which is not good enough for from uh, some other products. I mean, one product we make, the, the web control consists of a window you can type skippy commands. Yep. That's not that's, very useful. Uh, well, it's, yeah. It meets the, the hardcore standard. guys cheer, but yeah, apart yeah. from that. Well, we still, that's an easy thing to integrate, but that's yeah. all the integrated, you know. Right. It, it meets the LXI standard, but that's about it. What we're, most of our products we're trying to standardize on is where you have a view at the front panel and you mm -hmm. can press buttons and the display looks just like the front panel. Exactly. And yeah. that turns out to be, for most people, they just want to remotely control the yes. product and, yeah. and verify that it's doing what they expect it to so do. So that's what they expect. They expect to see something like that. <coughs> well, like no, there's a group of people who want it because the web has a giant uh, you know, CRT. You can do much more than mm. you do on a limited size front panel. Yep. And you can even add additional level, high level constructs that you wouldn't put in the product because it was hard to use on a small display. Of course. Um, that's the area that I think there's more debate. Can we do more of that? And my feeling is, uh, from an efficiency standpoint, let's get everything common, and mm -hmm. then let's move the whole thing as a phalanx forward and, and make it better, more efficiently. Instead, we have some groups going all the way to here, some groups going to here. It just doesn't lend itself toward efficiency. And what really frustrates me is we have a concept, the name that, that Ron came up with in the, the management staff called One Key Site. We want our customers to have a consistent One Key Site experience across mm -hmm. all of our products. That's as important as any one product. Got it. So we're really trying. We to we it. kind of we're a bit cynical, us engineers in the market, in that we think that's a bit, you know, that's a bit corporatey, silly. But it's it, it, if you if it wasn't there, you'd probably miss it. You probably it's probably underappreciated by us. I think most people, engineers. if you talk to them, if they own an Apple product. Right. Apple's the it's master a, yeah, of that yeah, one Apple, right. if you will, but they have that yep. consistent. Now, that doesn't mean Apple's perfect. No, there's no. lots of areas that there's, there, there, there's issues yep. with Apple's implementation, but for the most part, it makes people brand loyal, and it, they do have a consistency and a quality to the experience that they're very big on. You know, I'm not saying that we're trying to clone Apple, but we are trying to take some of that same shared experience mm -hmm. and make it more consistent. So we'll find this user interface on most of your benchtop products so, like uh, this? We have a, a box coming your way with the new yep. E36 3, 11, 12, or 13, I don't know which one they're going to send you. Um, and there are screens on that that are identical to the screens on right. this. For things like setting up the LAN, things for setting up the file manager, you know, yep. 
why have different experience on each one? It's a file manager, you know. Yeah. And that's that's something as an example that we literally have four or five different implementations on this exact screen because it was developed here versus here versus here. Uh -huh. That's not acceptable anymore. Yep. We're paying for something three times. Oh no, of course, yeah, that's, that's crazy. That's a and killer. our customers hate that. Yep. They learn how one Yeah, no, I don't, yeah, I want to be able to use the same, I expect the same interface. And you're not getting it today. Yes, <laughs> but that's being worked on. Absolutely. Excellent. How quickly can you spin uh, fix firmware issues and things. Someone reports a firmware issue on a product. How? What's the mechanism to fixing so that? If a firmware issue comes up, the, the hard part is getting it to the people who can fix it. Yep. And because we're a big company, it, it technically goes into our support group. The mm. first thing they have to go is to invalid it's truly a mistake. And sometimes that communication takes a while. Because this is not the customer yeah. who wants to just sit on the phone on hold waiting for the support person to describe it and document it. That can take the longest amount of time. When it because gets to the design team, yeah. depending on how hard it is to fix the bug, that can take a couple days, it can yeah. take a couple weeks. If it's a case of a memory overflow yeah. that only happens on a rare occasion, uh -huh. that's the hardest thing to yep. catch. Um, that might take two, three, four weeks to yeah. get it, you know, catch it with its pants down, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Once you find it, it takes very little time to fix it, and then right. it takes typically a week or two to guarantee that we didn't break something else. We do exhaustive testing before we ship a firmware update yep. out because the worst thing you can do is fix it and break, and break something, something else. else. Right. Yep. So that's, exactly. that delays us getting out there because we have very, very thorough regression testing and even mm -hmm. that doesn't have perfect coverage. So we like people, we'll pass it around to people to make sure that, you know, other people to make sure we didn't break something else in the process. Is that an automated testing? Do you have automated tools in place to like to exercise all Absolutely. these functions remotely Absolutely. and just go through every possible Well, we do for the bus, for the buses, all the different buses, you know, GPIB, yep. uh, LAN, USB, but Front panel is very difficult to automate. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, oh, you can use vision. Yeah, right? but you can push the buttons from the... You can push the buttons, but you actually have to look the at the LXI. display. Yeah. You have to look at it, and with vision systems, it's very complex and time-consuming to program vision systems to simulate right. all that stuff and catch it. And, you, you know, okay, so it's different. Then someone still has to look at, well, well how is it different and mm -hmm. figure out what that means. There's no artificial intelligence engine to make all that happen. Yep. So front panels are probably the biggest headache when it comes to automated testing. Um, and catching things. Uh, the bus stuff is much more amenable to automation. And yep. also, though, a voltmeter, you're measuring voltage. We have to make special fixtures that feed different reference yeah, signals in of, of different types. So, And actually, the hardest one, believe it or not, to write regression is power products because you have both sourcing and yes. loading and measurement. It's and, nasty. And different types of yep. sequencing. Like, So, for example, most of our power products have the ability to put out sequences mm -hmm. and with different time delays and all that. So it's, that can get very complicated to do regression testing. The 3458A, mm -hmm. there's rumors that maybe a new one's in the works. Are, are you still going for those sort of, you know, the top of the line uh, cow lab type instruments? Is that still on? The 3458 is sites. one of the most revered mm -hmm. products yes, in our exactly. history. Today, it has yep. not been eclipsed by anybody for yep. absolute performance. We know that's really important, and we will not mm -hmm. let our customers down. Okay. That's so, about all I can say. Okay. Being worked on. I didn't it's being that. considered. We will not let our customers not, down. We will not let your customers down. Well done. <laughs> All right. Um, with old products like that, I mean, how long has that one been around? As long as the 34401. They were released. The, you're right. Okay. Yeah, like so. Mid 80s. Yeah. 20, 30 years. It's been a while. Wow. Um, do you, have you lost talent? I mean, clearly you're going to lose talent if people know. Like you know, like at a high, at such high end, there's so much subtle magic in there that. So I actually know, managed the, the two does, guys working on yeah, that. Yeah. The, the first time we tried to do a replacement on it, uh, and it was fascinating for me to learn the kind of subtleties they have to go mm -hmm. through on that. And I learned a great deal about you know high end voltmeter managing those two guys. Both those two guys are still with the company. They're still with the company. Now, the wow. four guys, the four horsemen that developed the original 58, yeah. none of those four guys are still with the company. Ah, one of those four guys is yeah. one of our biggest competitors that makes right. TMMs. Right. Okay? And he's an amazing engineer that we mm -hmm. lost. We were very unhappy that he went to the dark yep. side. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's still developing with them. He's still doing quite a, quite right. a lot of good things for them. Uh, the, the, the 58 has some of the most challenging aspects mm. to it that the subtleties of that 
one of our R&D managers who was running the group at the time came over and one of the, the four guys was still at the company had a handkerchief laying over the circuit board when he yeah. was testing it. And he says, why are you doing it? And he says, because the subtle differences in the air temperature yeah. going over some of the parts were moving tenth of a degree and it showed up as noise. You could, you could, see, you could see it. You could see the fluttering of the air on top of the parts it was changing the, great. the DC measures. Yep. So is that hard to, so you've still got some talent Oh yeah, well the R&D manager yep. that managed those four yep. guys is still with us um, right. and he's busy and has been busy training um, a younger guy who's mm. he's been there 15, 18 years. Um, he developed the 34... I was going to say, yes, 60, some of them 61. apparently yes. were, went into this. Yes, yep. and both of those guys are still with us and we're, we're looking at how we can take that to the next level so mm -hmm. to kind of do it even higher. We have a seven and a half digit model now yeah. and um, the seven and a half is very close to 58 performance. Wow. I mean, in yep. some areas, we, we know some of the stuff we'd have to do to upgrade uh -huh. it to that next level. So we came very close to having a completely new 58 design, but the part of the challenge with our old management team was they said, you're just replacing the revenue we had before. There's no growth in that. There's no new profit in that. Mm -hmm. And we were part of the life sciences cash cow. They, they didn't want to spend <laughs> oh, the money. No. Now that we're a test and no. measurement company exclusively, yep. there's a lot more willingness to, to be having a premier product in our catalog that we understand. Got it. And that's one of the great things about being a pure test and measurement play, is we're much more focused on what matters. The reference inside this and others, are they getting <clears throat> difficult to get? No. No? They're so still... that's an interesting story. The, yep. the, the reference that's inside the 3458 is, mm -hmm. was developed by us 30 years ago, and we came to the conclusion that we're not the right people to make it. Mm -hmm. So we gave the design to linear technology. This is the LTZ 1000? Correct. Yep. And okay, you guys developed it. We developed that. it and we wow. gave it to them. Yep. And we have a, a big burning system in our fa factory mm -hmm. that we mount them in little boards and mm -hmm. we burn them in and we sell graded versions graded, of for, right. for yep. better results. Now the seven and a half digit one, this one, this is the seven uses, and a half digit. The yep. uses the LTZ 1000. It's one yeah, of the it things does. that allows yep. us to get to seven and a half digits because mm -hmm. the drift. This doesn't have all the hooks that a 58 has. Right. It doesn't have the level of ACAL. It doesn't have the, the AC measurement technology that's mm -hmm. unique on the 58. Um, some of that stuff is, is more straightforward. We had already started to work on redesigning that, and stay tuned. Okay. okay? Um, we're, we're in the process of looking how to like, take things to the next level, because mm -hmm. there's still a lot of new measurement technology that can be done. A voltmeter is a fundamental building block for a lot of what we call synthetic measurement technology. And mm -hmm. We're looking for how we can grow into other measurements. And that's one of our competitors um, down in Texas does a great job. At, all they do is synthetic mm -hmm. measurements. Right. Because their, their granularity is a little card about this big. They pop into a frame. Mm -hmm. um, we have focused on the standalone. They focused on that. There, there's a significant opportunity in that area for us. And we think you're going to see more of that over time. Interesting. What, what sort of volumes would those high-end instruments sell at? I wouldn't imagine there's, like... How much would they have to sell for to get to make it worthwhile? All the years and years of developing such a high-end product with such a limited market, it's which is as, basically cow it's, labs. It's and not as limited as you trend. think. No. No. And one okay. of the bigger opportunities for the 58, and it's kind of surprising when you look at uh, high volume consumer products. Mm -hmm. Throughput is a huge factor mm -hmm. for these people. Yep. Where you know the, the the voltmeter, even if it's a ten thousand dollar box like the 58. Um, it's the cheapest piece of equipment in the rack. You start putting a spec in or a high-end yeah, scope okay, or something like that, true. it's 30, 40,000, and you've got material handling equipment trying to move this stuff in and uh -huh. test it in a few seconds. Yep. You put a eight and a half digit voltmeter in that system, you don't have to change ranges ever, and you still get an accurate reading. Got on it. A six so and it's half, much faster test throughput Much for the faster product. test. Yep, yep. You don't have to change ranges. You can lock it on a 100 volt range no matter what signal comes in, you right. get an accurate reading. Yeah. On a six and a half, you might have to change ranges. And that takes time. Reading, and it takes time. And, and it slows down your product. That's right. So yeah. we have some people using the 58 for its throughput benefits. Right. Uh, we have other people who build large multi-base systems. They put a 58 at the mm -hmm. bottom of the rack, and they recertify and cal everything else in the rack every day. Right. Because they, they want the system to be robust. Yeah. And we sell into military aerospace. It's a very popular uh, configuration. So it's not all just cal labs. In fact, frankly, cal labs, we've, we've lost a lot of that business mm -hmm. to our big competitor in, in Everett. You know, the, Got it. They, yeah. They've really taken over a lot of the cow. They really focused on cow as a as a big deal. We get less of that than we used to get for sure. And these other things, you know, this kind of transfer standard where they mount it in the rack, they mm -hmm. just calibrate the 58, yeah. and then they put it back in the rack, and it calibrates everything else. Got it. And because it's so accurate, 
that's that works. You know, it, mm -hmm. you might have one of these. They might have some some pixie cards, some other things. You know, an arm uh, a function generator. This, mm -hmm. the, the 58 has incredible RMS and EC measurements. It can verify all those things in the rack. They just route everything through it. It does a confidence check and a, and a calibration, and it's less expensive and smaller than the, the other competitor's product. Can we expect to see an eight and a half digit bench one like this rather than a rack meter? Because if, if there's benefits to throughput, I mean, I mean, seven and a half digits is almost there, but yes. if you can get the extra, I don't know exactly what we're going to do that there. I mean. That's an interesting question. Mm. I don't know if there's as much benefit to having it on a bench where you're, you're dealing with data on it's, the front panel. Right, yep. It's more automated system rack mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. You know, again, the AC measurement technology in the 58 is something that has a lot of benefit in a standalone like this. So mm -hmm. we are looking at how can we bring that, that kind of technology forward. But the, the pure eight and a half digitness, mm -hmm. there was a lot of debate to do a seven and a half in this format. Okay, and interesting. We, we fought that battle over and over. And yep. then finally people said, you know, how much will we get out of it? And, they said, mm -hmm. well, we, the technology is so common, we think we can do it fairly quickly. Yep. It's one of the tricks is if you can make the effort low, people stop arguing with you. When right. the effort's yeah, high, yeah, like yeah, a 58 yeah. replacement, they really argue you know, down to the bone because yep. it's going to cost you $12 million for a project to do it. For this, they, this was a follow-on to the, the 60 and 61, and it took a lot mm -hmm. less time because they planned for it. Oh, so when you're first designing this, you thought maybe we might do a 7.5, or no, when, did when that they, come later? They, they knew the 7.5 was right. on the roadmap. Okay. We, we knew right. it was coming. They didn't lay out all at one time, but still, yep. because we had the front panel and we had all the other pieces, they, they could do it in a lot less yep. resources. So instead of having a team of 12, I think it was a team of four. Yeah, and Yemi did it 10% yes. of his time because the package was already done. Exactly. It's supplied. just a matter of change. Uh, engineering the seven and a half digit measurement solution, everything else is the same. Yep. Yep. So it was a lot quicker, lots mm -hmm. more project team, and as a follow-on, and all the, even all the marketing literature and documentation was reusable. All the screens are the same, yep. for example. Exactly. So the firmware was minimal change. Got it. Do you see? Do you laugh at the competition that try and do like six and a half digits and their specs aren't even close? Or are, com or are we, some we, of the Chinese we competitors... We never laugh at anybody. No, no, no. But are some of the Chinese competitors getting there? I, I think the or? biggest mistake we make is to ever underestimate our competitors. Right. We yeah. were talking about this this morning. You know, in the, in the U.S., the, the Toyota and Honda came into the U.S. market with terrible, terrible, inexpensive cars. Mm. So did Hyundai. Yep. And Toyota of course now they produce the most reliable. And they're the, the yeah. largest selling car in the world. Yep. Hyundai is the fastest growing car company yep. in the world. All right. Ignoring your competitors, big or small, is mm -hmm. always a mistake. You know, being arrogant is, yep. was our, 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 a big mistake we made for many years. Got and it. it's something that will not be repeated if a few of us have anything to say about it. Excellent. You don't get to be the best and yep. then get arrogant. You won't stay the best for very long. So what we can talk about is one of the things that I, I really was happy to be able to do this with you mm -hmm. is the kind of shift in how people learn about products. Yep. And you know, one of the things I, I tell people, so for example, we developed the 36, 311, 12, and 13. I demanded that all the projects on the project team go to your blog and ah, read about all the go. things you did on Legal <laughs> and everybody else. Yep. I said all uh, the criticism, all, all the, the, all the criticism, vitriol, all but the... all the things they get right too. I was right, telling yeah, people, yeah. I don't want to know what they got wrong. I yep. want to know what they got right. Mm -hmm. I want to learn what they figured out that I can use. Yep. And you know, Steve Jobs said, "Art is steel." Yeah, yeah, and, great, and, Ab absolutely. And I look at something, uh, what you provide to the uh, the industry mm. is much like a movie critic. You you save me from watching bad movies, <laughs> right. okay? And at the same time, you teach me what to look for and, yep. and what the craft of a great movie is. So we really appreciate what you bring to the market. And you know, the fact is, you're much more accessible than those millions of customers that you mm -hmm. represent. Um, so it, it's something that, as we've tapped in more to social media, we think that what, you are really a valuable resource for all of us in the test and measurement industry. You mm -hmm. make our industry a better industry for it. You, you are an objective purveyor of how good products are. You, I think you're going to make all of our products better. You're going to make their Excellent. products better, I hope and you're so. going to make our products better. That's the better. intention. Right. And that's yeah. something that I think is really exciting. And a little scary too, because mm. we don't have any control of what oh, you say. Oh, of course, no, anything. exactly. It's it, it, so yeah. from that standpoint, it can be a little frightening. I, I did not come to this today, you know, with, without a little trepidation. <laughs> no, you've got to take the hits with the, you know, right. they've got to, you know, if your product fails, like a, you know, the the meter, for example, the mm -hmm. you remember the uh, the the uh, uh, twelve yes. seventy two, yes, meter, and there were soldering issues, and they've gone through. But I like to think that people value the response That's right. that you give. If you, if you just ignore it, then they're not going to give out and say, hey, 
yep, we admit it's a problem, we're working on it, everyone's going to think better of the company. You know, there's, a, there's an old cliche that it isn't what you do when you fall down, it's what you do when you get up. Get up, yeah. And to us, you know, what you bring to the market is really mm -hmm. an invaluable resource that makes us better. Excellent. And it's something you can harness that and, and get a perspective because when you say what you say, if your readers don't agree with you, mm -hmm. we read that too. So we oh, get yeah, a totally. wing and yeah. it really helps us create a perspective yeah. that it would, would be very difficult for us to get any other way. So you're actively looking to be on the forums and things and in an official company We have way? all of our project team members yep. for the low cost products, I demand they read all your forum stuff on all the products that compare to our product. To Fantastic. Learn. We yep. also buy all of our competitive products and tear them down. Yep. First we evaluate them in a black box way and mm -hmm. we've instituted a practice where they each of the engineers on the project has one of our competitive products and they actually have to use it ah, during yes. the project on the bench. Interesting. And every few months we sit down and say, wow. what, do, what do you feel now? And then yep. you know, some things that they got really right and sometimes yeah, yeah. we try to incorporate them in our product and other things yeah. that they didn't get right and we try to say, well how can we do it better? Mm -hmm. you know, what don't you like about it and did we end up tripping into that and doing it the same way? No, that's, you know, let's move the bar up. And so I think you've helped make that possible. So Fantastic. Speak. So that's how we're going to stay ahead. Well, I mean, I think we have some interesting stuff in all the different products. Um, one of the ones I find is the most amazing is what we call Trueform. Yep. Okay. Uh, Trueform is really, and I told you before it's a trade secret, but there's aspects of it that I can talk around without mm -hmm. giving the trade Please. secret. Um, if you look at a traditional DDS style function generator, DDS is great because it's cheap, mm -hmm. but it's got all sorts of problems. It's got jitter, it's got, it doesn't work uh, well for other types of square waves, for example. Square waves are horrendous with jitter yep. in, in DDS technology. Trueform has allowed us to dramatically simplify the structure of a function generator. I don't know if you're aware, but in the, the older function generators, they would not generate square waves with the DAC. Right. They would generate that a triangle was, yes. wave, yep. and they would run that into a comparator. Oh, it's just, and, and, no, 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 no. And now, <laughs> and you, would, you would have a limited, like, two or three yep. different slew rates, and you would have, like, yep. a 10% minimum duty cycle. Now, with Trueform, you can get less than 1% duty mm -hmm. cycle, and you can get in, infinitely variable slew rates. And that makes the product so much more usable on your bench. Yep. And we're actually looking at how can we take that technology and integrate it in more and more and more of our products, because it is so, so much better for testing and use. It's one of those things that when we first did it, we learned about it from the RF guys because they've done, they're trying to create spectral purity with their waveform right. generators and that's all they focused on. But they, this is one of these that I didn't get involved in, but it kind of showed what can happen. One of our guys from the team that develops function generators mm -hmm. actually went to California to our RF site and learned about it mm -hmm. a, at a lunchtime conversation. Right. <laughs> and he said, Oh my! And he was. Oh, stealing that! Yeah, yeah. He was smart enough to realize what it could right. mean for function generators. Brought it back. It takes a ton more FPGA. Yep. And in fact, in our, our 120 megahertz part, we actually had to do the the waveform in pipeline in four paths to get oh, the gigahertz wow. sample rate. Because yep. FPGAs don't want to run past about two. No, yeah, yeah, something like that. You know, that, that. Like, yeah. and we couldn't afford an ASIC because the volume on the high performance one is lower. So he actually figured out a way to pipeline the whole thing mm -hmm. as four paths, and then mix them all together with a delay line at the end. Nice. Um, and it gives us just an incredible benefit. And some of our competitors have picked up a little bit. I was going to say, a Siglin of doing a, they do a one that they claim is innovative. Is that just a copy of? No, it's not a copy because no? we don't, there's nothing to copy. We don't right. tell you what we did. We, no, but is the, but the intention is that they copied the intention. What they've done is a much simpler version that's right. not as sophisticated. It's a good solution. It's yep. not as good as what we've done. This is allows you to generate small uh, duty cycles in a large right. in a large memory depth. Right. Yeah. You know, what Siglin's done, I believe, is just basic interpolation. Right. Okay. okay. We've done is much more sophisticated than interpolation. Mm -hmm. It's um, much lower distortion, much lower jitter, much more fine grain. Um, yeah. And we're not telling them what we did because <laughs> right. the, once we tell them, they could do it too. Yeah, yeah. Although it was interesting, like I said, in the high frequency function area, once they knew how to do it, because they did it on the lower frequency mm -hmm. one, it was it's just one path. The hard part was putting it in a giant FPGA and figuring mm -hmm. out how to do four paths in parallel and then line them up at the end. Mm -hmm. That was really pretty tricky stuff. Um, but the, the, that's the kind of stuff, I, when you say digital, there's, it's, I don't think we've even really come close to fully fleshing out all the things we can do digitally to make yep. test and measurement equipment even better. I mean, I think the scopes, they're, they're doing spec ANS now, that's an example where they're saying, hey, what's the difference? And we're doing more and more and more of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. What you're going to see next is you're going to see where if you have two voltmeters in a function, you have yep. a low frequency network analyzer. Yes. 
That's right. But you can't do that today very well. No, it's, is, a clung, it's a bit clunk. It's a bit You can't synchronize the three. Yep. You yep. can't synchronize the thing. But there's no reason you can't. In Pixie, you can do it, but then you don't have the, the positive user interface. You don't mm -hmm. have it all linked together. So there's a lot more to come. How would you link them in a technical aspect? How would you link them? Like, would you link them through the network interface, or does it have to have a dedicated physical? Well, we we developed a technology called IEEE 1588 mm -hmm. uh, many years ago. We actually developed it in our labs and then gave it out to the world for free, like we did with GPIB. Mm. Um, 1588 is time sync over LAN. Right. And it's used yep. for video. It's used in everybody's house. They don't realize it. It's ah. used for how they do streaming video in your Apple ah. TV and stuff, and how they distribute streaming video in the cable and companies. And that was and Ed. Keyside or Agilent? It was developed Maybe. as, I Agilent. think, Hewlett Packard. Oh, oh that was HP. It's been around a long time. Wow, yeah. okay. It was one of those deals right. when we did GPIB, you have to pay a dollar to get a license so uh -huh. you know you're out there, but that's a little bit. I was a little bit miffed when I found out how much we gave away on it, but it's now built into all the microprocessors and LAN and stuff. Um, we've developed a method to take it a step further where you combine it with an FPGA and we can get picosecond level synchronization with 1588. Over the network? Over the network. Wow. Okay. How do you get Picos? Is that another trade secret and you're not going to tell trade us? Secret. Damn it. I can't, I can't ah. tell you, but it's, it's pretty amazing stuff that the labs guys have come up with. Um, the problem with 1588 is mm. if we just put it in our products and told you, you figure it out, yeah. it would be so complex they couldn't. I mean, right. It's, it's really difficult. So you, you need know, the application layer to do it? You need the it? application layer to do it. And yeah. frankly, one of our right. weaknesses as a company is our software has not been up to snuff. Hence your new Right. So now groups. we're renewing our focus yep. on software and really putting a lot of money and time Got into it. software so we can start getting out some of these yep. higher level solution focus. The, the big term in the company today is solutions, not hardware. Got it. Software, not just hardware. It's, you know, it's hardware, software, and people make solutions. And that's really what it's all that's about. That's what I was doing the other day. I was uh, characterizing the power supply on the bench. Mm -hmm. And I uh, wrote them all down by hand. You know, I didn't because I couldn't be bothered or tr figuring out how to automate them. You know, they're all got LXI connectivity and right. everything else. I'm not going to say, but if there was a solution that w I could just download from the website, oh, just tie these together that's right. and it just worked, yeah, I would have used it. It's going to take but us a while wasn't. to fully flesh out that outcome, but that's in yep. the path we're on. Yep. There's no question about it. That's really where we're going because that's the kind of problems that people face today. They mm -hmm. don't have time to figure this stuff out. And yep. the, you know, you look at the emergence of IoT and 5G and some of these new emerging technologies, there's going to be more electronics in everything you own. Yeah. I mean, everywhere you turn, from when you walk in the room, the lights turn on because mm -hmm. there's a sensor that senses you coming in and, and all that. That's just the beginning. There's so much more that's coming with all these new emerging technologies and they just don't have the time to do it the old fashioned way. You know, they and they're often non-engineers. That's right. Doing that's a really doing good point. design. Yeah, that's right? Really good point. It's just like they're, like they're gluing every, together Arduinos or Raspberry Pis yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. And yep. And they're doing amazing stuff because they're using all this off the shelf that's right. hardware and software. But how do you characterize that stuff in more complex yep. ways? And that's really the challenge for us is to create higher level integrated solutions with multiple boxes to, to make it Got happen. It. And it's a huge challenge because it forces us to stop being little sites that develop independent products and start yep. creating like one key site. And that's why uh, our management team has really shifted investment focus dramatically toward the mm -hmm. software, toward the solution side, even to the point of how we market and sell our products. We now have what we call solution teams and centers of excellence. And I'm responsible for a third of the company um, as the technical side of centers of excellence. And my boss is the manager for all this group. And we have four solution teams tied to key industries. Mm -hmm. right, so we have one automotive and energy group. We have one general purpose and education group. We have a wafer test, semiconductor mm -hmm. test, and, and board test. And those groups just focus on solutions in those industries. And automotive is, I think, the one of the most fascinating ones, because let's face it, 10 years from now, you're going to be reading a book where the car takes you where you want to go. Right. You know, it's yes. only a matter of time until that self-driving yep. vehicle. And the technical challenges behind autonomous vehicles are just, it's off the charts crazy. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. what they're going to do to, you know, Google and other people are doing these self-driving vehicles that they map everything out. And mm -hmm. You know what they're finding out? They're finding out what? that it don't work so good. Yeah. And, and <laughs> when it's raining, when there's construction, uh -huh. you know, solving those problems is, is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And relying on networks to go back to central computers. I mm, was just, I was driving across Sydney the other, Sydney is impossible to drive in at the best of times. Mm -hmm. It's just terrible. But I was driving home at night. It was torrential pouring rain. And it was construction everywhere. They're chopping and changing lanes on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I went, no, like, this is just a nightmare from a, a self-driving car point of view. Right. It's just terrible. 
and they, they know you, that, and they yeah. know that, but they still, this is an enabler for them to sell you an even more expensive car, or even, you're going to rent right. time on a car. The car's right. going to get so expensive, we're not going to own them, and they're going to have, how do you feel about a car that the other guy didn't put air in his tires? <laughs> right. uh, when you're driving at 200 yeah, yeah. miles an hour in an yep. auto, autonomous it's, driving lane. Yeah. So there, a lot of things are going to change in ways that I don't think people are ready yet for, mm. um, but the technology that's going to emerge, because that's what people yeah. want, is going to be, it's going to be crazy. Do you think it's going to take longer than most people think? Because everyone's talking, oh yeah, it's going to be here like that. I think in limited areas yeah. it's going to be sooner, but I think it's going to take longer to get all the bugs worked mm -hmm. out. One of the things they're talking about now is that they probably have to put transducers in the road. Oh yeah, no, the, once you get to that level it's... Well, I, they're going to turn the uh, HOV lanes are going to become right. auto driving lanes. That's going to okay. be the first place they say and you're right. going to see it. They're going to repurpose the HOV lanes and you're going to pull into like a gating area with an entrance ramp. Ah. The car's going to stop and then it's going to pop you in at you know, right. speed. Yeah, you're yeah. going to be tailgating the car. Behind, Got it. You know. And then you, right. So you, you, bake, you break the, the wind barrier so you get efficiency yep. at higher speeds. And when th it'll be like airplane crashes. When an accident happens, a lot of people are going to die, but it'll yeah, happen right. very infrequently. Very infrequently, exactly. That's going to be one of the, I think, one of the most amazing transformations mm. that's going to change everything we know. But even the way that electronics is in our lives, one of the things that we've been looking at is counterfeiting. Right. You know, Ray-Ban sunglasses. Oh, yeah, yeah. brands. 60% right. of all Ray-Bans are counterfeit. Wow. Okay. Yep. So they're talking about putting electronic chips in every pair oh. so that they can tell if it's counterfeit. Yep, and but then they can just copy that as well. But they're always it, gets it gets harder. It gets harder You're yeah. trying to be one step ahead. That's right. Yeah. Is, is there a point where that one step ahead thing, just you may as well, you're better off giving up and just uh, figuring out a better way to... Well, how do you feel about do taking it? medicine when it's fake? You <laughs> yeah, no. You don't give up, exactly. right? No, no. You'd be <laughs> true... Well played. Pacemakers. Right. No, I have an yeah, yeah. artificial pacemaker, but it's fake. Yeah, okay. You know, so there's some yeah. security issues that you may not want to ever see a fake. But there's Got problems it. in that area, too, with drugs yeah. and, and food. And, you know, they're talking mm. about putting, you're, you're going to get meat, and it's going to have a tracer in the meat. Yeah. And you're going to you swallow it, and you're going right. to take it out the other way, and that's, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. It's insane.